My name is Rosemary Horning. I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Upland. And this workshop is on uh, the city's water supply and reliability. And so I want to start it out. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I know it's your time and it's valuable. And it's in the evening and you probably would rather be home with your families eating dinner. Um, so I do appreciate that you come out tonight to hear my presentation on uh, the city's water supply. Just as a matter of uh, utility, I want to let you know that if you need to use the restroom, we have restrooms right outside and to your right. Um, and then we have some water and refreshments at the back of the room in, in case you want to get uh, uh, something uh, for yourself during the presentation. Again, this is Upland's water supply, and I want to give you a little bit of a background or the intent of my presentation this evening is to inform you as to where our water comes from um, and also to explain a little bit of background uh, on water itself and um, uh, our rights and, and uh, limitations associated with uh, water supply and also the uh, kind of conclude a little bit with the threats that um, uh, impact our water in the future so with that we'll get started i think uh, the first basic uh, uh, elements that we should provide to you this evening is where, where does our water come from? And Upland is very fortunate in that it has a diverse water supply and it has access to different types of water supply. Our uh, most important uh, water that we have access to is our local water supplies, which include groundwater uh, production. So underneath us here, in, uh, underneath the ground that we're standing on right now, is a, is a uh, water aquifer that we draw out of. Um, we have also access to local, local surface water, and we receive uh, or we have access to imported water supplies as well. And on the chart, you'll see that um, you know our local groundwater supplies come from three uh, different adjudicated basins, and I'll I'll uh, show you the, where those basins are within with respect to the city, um, and then our surface water supplies, and then our imported water supply. Um, this is a really important map, and it's a little bit busy, but I'm going to highlight. Uh, I'm going to highlight this little peak that happens right here. And it's, this peak represents uh, the separation between our three groundwater basins where we we're, we're get our, water, our local groundwater supply from. On the left side of the city or the west side of the city uh, near Claremont, we, uh, we have a number of city wells and uh, West End Consolidated Water Company water supply wells that produ produce water out of the six basins. That's this basin here, and that's this area on this side, on, on the west side of the city's uh, jurisdiction. Um, in the center, we have uh, what we call the Chino Basin, and on the east side of the city near Rancho Cucamonga is, our, is the Cucamonga Basin. And all three of these groundwater basins are adjudicated meaning that there's a court order or a court decree that uh, identifies how much water can be produced out of each of these basins and which parties are entitled to, to produce that water and how much are they entitled to produce it. And there are water masters that regulate and monitor you know, how each of these parties to the judgments um, produce water within those basins. In some cases, there are opportunities to store water in the basin because it's, it's a large aquifer. In other cases, they um, create a, what you call an operating safe field each year. And that's the, that number that's established is the number that the parties to the judgment can um, use to produce the water supply. So uh, again, our, oops, I'm sorry. The, this map is really important just from the standpoint that it provides a good overview. The yellow boundary is the city's jurisdictional boundary. Again, that blue line that I showed to you is um, our uh, separation between the groundwater basins. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is on both the west and the east side of the city of Upland, there are uh, spreading grounds or washes where we capture stormwater that 
uh, falls in the mountains and runs off the mountains, and we're able to capture that water and recharge it. And we'll have some slides later in the, uh, in the presentation that, that show that. Um, just in general, I put this slide in here because it's important to understand that our local groundwater supply comes to us through this hydrologic cycle, which means as winter season comes, it rains. For a number of years, we had dry periods where we didn't have rain, but when we have rain, that rain falls and it infiltrates into the ground and it replenishes our groundwater aquifer. When we have dry periods and no rain, um, we're drawing water, groundwater out of the aquifer, but it's it's um, it's not being replenished because it's not because there's not natural rainfall that's falling and recharging those aquifers. So when we had this extended drought, we were using the reserves that we have under the ground to produce water for the community. Now that we're starting to see some wet cycles, we're starting to replenish some of the draft that we have, that occurred um, in the uh, prior years. Yes, there's a question. Where does the recycled water come in? Um, recycled water comes from Inland Empire Utilities Agency. There are, uh, there are vendor or contractor for sewage waste disposal and treatment. And so they have a number of wastewater treatment plants in, in the, um, uh, in, in the area here, and there's, a, there's about seven agencies that uh, contract with uh, Inland Empire Utility Agency and send their waste to, the, to those treatment plants where the, the, the wastewater is processed and then the uh, effluent or the product water out of those treatment plants can be used as recycled water um, in the various jurisdictions that are member agencies. And in 2013, we were, is when we first got access to recycled water because they have to, the treatment plants are kind of at the lowest point um, in the system and we're kind of up at the top of the foothills. So they had to build pipelines to be able to pump that water up and for us to be able to serve it to our community. So we didn't get recycled water until 2013, but it is a very reliable source of water and we use it um, at a number of our parks uh, within the city of Upland. There's one main backbone that um, along, I would say, maybe Campus Avenue and 16th Street that uh, serves uh, recycled water and we have some laterals. Again, servicing Memorial Park, uh, Sierra Vista Park, uh, the golf course, the Upland Hills Country Club golf course is, a, is served by it. Um, and a number of other uh, parks. It's it's a small it's a small component right now of our water supply, but it is a it is one of our water uh, one of our water supplies in our portfolio. So thanks for bringing that up. In that Sir? previous slide, what was WFA? I saw there was something that said WFA. Um, WFA. WFA is our is called the Water Facilities Authority. Oh. It's our imported water treatment plant up on Benson and 17th Street. So. There's a, we're, we have a joint powers authority with the WFA where there are five agencies, Upland, Ontario, uh, Monte Vista Water District, Chino and Chino Hills that all banded together, formed a JPA and we built this 81 million gallon water treatment plant which Upland owns 22% of the plant. And so that's how we get our imported water supply. And Inland Empire Utility Agency, which is our sewer provider, is also our imported water wholesaler with MWD. So they're, they're a met member agency, as they call it, and we get our imported water through Metropolitan Water District, through Inland Empire Utility Agency. Yes, sir? Is that water, um, is that what's in the multi-million gallon reservoir that's going to be replaced, that needs to be replaced at 17th Benson? Well, the water that's stored in there, what entity is that from? Well, the water, the replacement reservoir that you're referring to is on the northwest corner of 17th Street and Benson Avenue. That's where we're going to build the replacement reservoir. Right. Just to the west of it is the existing reservoir that needs to be replaced. Right. And that is the point of entry for that imported water supply. So everything that comes out of the plant goes through that reservoir and then into the system. If we, and we have to take minimum amount of water from 
the water facilities authority every day a minimum amount of water to keep the plant running. Thank you. So, Question. yes, sir. Uh, those three basins, do they have some natural um, underground uh, delineation between them, or is it just kind of a decision as to which? No, where, where basin you're, is? you're absolutely correct. The reason why those basins are divided the way they are is because there's there are uh, fault lines that have created uh, a change in the geology because of the movement along the fault line. So. As that fault line moves back and forth, it crushes the alluvial materials that are there and creates fine sediments and creates a barrier. Not a complete barrier, but a barrier or a, more of a kind of a control point, if you will, for water. So we still have some seepage from one groundwater basin into another groundwater basin, but it does deflect the water and makes it kind of stay within, within its own little basin area. Um, one of the things that I should say is the Cucamonga Basin and the six basins are smaller basins than the Chino Basin, so their capacity is a lot less and their operating safe yield is a lot less as well. Um, so I wanted to show you a little cutaway. We talked about geology, but on this map you see it's the overlay of, let's say, the city and you see some recharge basins where we might take water off the channel and put it in a basin, it, and it serves both flood management and groundwater recharge. Well, that helps to capture that water and percolate it into the ground, into our groundwater reservoirs that we extract and use wells to extract that water out during the dry periods or even during uh, wet periods as well. So this is a just a nice little cutaway of, you know, what, what, um, you know, the, lay of the surface of the land and what it looks like underneath the land. And as you can see, um, you know, this is all related to groundwater production. The city and West End have about nine, nine wells in the six basins, which is on the west side of the city. Uh, we have five uh, wells in the Chino Basin, and West End has one well in the Cucamonga Basin that we get water from. I think the other, the other important thing is that the city of Upland gets that water either di through direct rights, meaning we have adjudicated rights in those basins, or we own shares in stock from mutual water companies like West End Consolidated Water Company or San Antonio Water Company that entitle us to water through their rights in those three adjudicated basins. So, um, that's how uh, we get our, uh, our water for the city. What I wanted to show you here, we talked about the hydrologic cycle a little bit, and, and this is precipitation in the years that uh, we, we've uh, received rainfall. Um, and this is a, you know, you have to pick what kind of a year do you want to display. And so these are calendar years just for um, simplicity, but the city operates its budget on a fiscal year, which is from July to June, and a water year is typically October to, uh, to September. So there's different, you know, every um, entity will use a different year. So I wanted to clarify that this is a calendar year. And as you can see, um, in 2010, we had a very wet year, but then we've had dry years from 2011 forward, and the average rainfall in this area, in this geographic area, is about 20 inches per year. So overall, you know, you see the wet year in 2010, you see a wet year, wet years starting to come back in 2017, 18, and 19, but we had a number of years where we didn't get enough rainfall to replenish our groundwater aquifer, and we were drawing on the reserves that were in the ground. So we're now seeing spreading that's occurring um, in the San Antonio spreading grounds and, and the Cucamonga spreading grounds, which is helping to replenish that water. But in the next slide, you're gonna see how does that impact. And uh, uh, on the left side of this chart is that precipitation that we saw on the other side just represented a little, on the previous slide just represented a little differently. And this is of the six basins groundwater aquifer but on the east side, you see 
At the top of the graph, the operating safe yield is adjudicated at 19,300 acre feet. So when they established the court order, they said this was the safe yield of the basin. We go back and we evaluate what is the appropriate safe yield of the basin on an annual basis. And what you can see is that um, what's happening is that the operating safe yield, which was, is at, is, is, as far as the court uh, stated originally, 19.3, but because we're having, and in I think 2010 or, or this, this time frame, we had some spikes in um, that operating safe yield, but you see how the dry, the dry climate is affecting the operating safe yield, and so all of the parties today only have access to 13,000 acre feet when they would, under really ideal conditions, have 19,000 acre feet. Yes? Is the safe yield determined by measurements of water in the ground, or? Yes. Okay. So there's, there are key wells in the water master will, we, we constantly record what's the level of the groundwater, and as the groundwater level decreases, the ability for you to produce that water decreases, in fact, um, in 2016-17, many of our wells that we have were on timers, meaning you could only run them a few hours of the day before they wouldn't, they would break uh, head or they wouldn't be able to function properly, and so we had to shut them down and allow the aquifer to recover and then run them again. So today, because of the rain, that, the extraordinary rain that we've had, we actually this year to date, from January to today, we're at close to 39 inches of rain. So in our average year is 20 inches of rain. So we're seeing those wells that we were running on timers now um, being able to run them 24 hours a day if we want to. Because the water table has rebounded and now we have that ability to, to run that capacity. How far back do you go to get your average rainfall at 20 inches? Um, I could I could go back the, in the six basins. I went back, you know, uh, a number of years. You could go back to the adjudication in Chino Basin. It goes back to the 70s. I mean, didn't want to show those graphs because they're really busy. There, there's a lot of information there, and I just thought these two graphs would at least show what I'm trying to convey to you is that when we have dry climate, and we're asking everybody to conserve. It's because our access to that water is, is diminished because we're not getting that rainfall recharge. And in fact, in the six basins, the concern that most that we have as part of our decree is when we replenish too much water, we see rising groundwater in Claremont. So you will hear, you know, a few years <coughs> back, they had water that was showing up in people's basements and that kind of thing because of the just extraordinary amount of water that um, had, was able to be percolated into the groundwater aquifer. So we monitor rising and we, we monitor lowering. And recently there was some state legislation um, that created the Ground, uh, Groundwater Sustainability Management Act, which now requires all non-adjudicated basins to, do, to develop um, um, production plans and and whatnot so that they can make sure that they're doing the right thing in terms of managing the resources and not over depleting them. In adjudicated basins, we aren't subject to all of that. We still have to report, but we're not subject to the same requirements as those basins like in, the, in um, other areas of the state that just haven't had the kind of monitoring that we have during, you know, from our water master folks. So this is just showing you even State, we're not necessarily in a drought, but if you look at these graphs locally here, we're still in a position of where, where we're not in more normal conditions. So everybody really still needs to conserve um, uh, our precious water supply, and that we need to make that a way of life. You know, yes, ma'am. Just to get a reference, about how many acre feet does an average household use per year? Well, on an average, and it's changing because people are becoming more efficient, but it, the rule of thumb is that two average homes would use one acre foot of water a year on a, on a yearly basis. Thank you. Yeah. 
And so I wanted to, you know, graphs and charts, I wanted to kind of liven it up a little bit. Um, these are just some pictures of some of our well facilities that we have. In the, in, on, the, on the left, you see us doing a well rehabilitation. We take a big, there's a big rig that comes in. There's a big pipe column, if you remember the cutaway, that the well um, sticks into the ground. Uh, these are the, the impellers or the bowls that help draw the water to the ground surface so that it can be distributed into our, uh, into our water system. And on, the, on this side, you see the motor. And our staff, we have a staff of five water treatment operators. They go out um, and they're, they check these wells on a daily basis. They listen to them, they lubricate them, they um, run uh, tests, water quality tests and monitor and whatnot. So um, these guys are pretty busy uh, with their daily activities. How, how deep are most of our wells? Oh, you know, the groundwater table is probably, it, it, it varies from groundwater basin to groundwater basin, but it's 500 feet deep and these wells are like 800 feet. Oh, that deep? Yeah. Yeah. So, and here you see the, them, um, again, taking water samples. We take about 3,000 water samples a year to make sure that the water quality that we're delivering to our customers is meets all the requirements and is, and is of good condition. So, um, you know, there's a consumer confidence report in the back of the room that um, is available on our website every year uh, before July 1st. We have to publish that report and it gives you a synopsis of the water systems and where we get our water supply and the quality of the water. Um, that we're providing to our customers, but this is this water is better than any kind of bottled water that you might buy at the store. Sir, uh, if if the water table in Upland is 500 feet deep, how come it backs up in basements in Glenmore? Well, that's a good question. Um, right now, we're we're our our uh, water groundwater level is low because we've been drawing water out of the ground to serve to our customers. <coughs> And we haven't had the rainfall to replenish it, but this, for example, the six basins water master, they're projecting that we could recharge as much as 31,000 acre feet before we need to, where before we need to be concerned about rising groundwater levels in the city of Claremont. So that was years ago. Yes, absolutely. Not not conditions today. Uh, conditions today are still in a in a, a, a locally local drought um, um, cycle. So, again, you know, these guys do. These guys are all uh, certified by the Department of Drinking Water to take samples and operate our system. Um, well, we have one chief water systems operator, and he's the highest grade treatment operator and distribution operator that you can uh, get. So these guys are really highly qualified um, in terms of their, the job that they're doing for the city. Um, this is our water treatment plant, local surface water treatment plant. Remember I told you that we get water from the Mount Baldy area from San Antonio Canyon? Well, this treatment plant is located just south of San Antonio Canyon Dam. It's a six million gallon a day capacity treatment plant. We're running about two million gallons right now through the treatment plant. And it, it's a seasonal plant, meaning that if we have rain, we have water in the creek that we can that we we uh, we can transfer to this facility um, and treat and deliver to our customers. We love the water that we get from uh, this source, this canyon water. It's very high quality water. It's um, extremely uh, good water. Um, the water that we're getting from the canyon canyon is through our San Antonio Water Company entitlement rights. We, the city of Upland, doesn't have any rights to that water, but but they do because they were a, 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 a formed back in 1882. San Antonio Water Company. They were one of the original um, uh, irrigation companies in this area. And as development occurred, we started to acquire uh, those rights to that water. Um, and we're still acquiring rights from San Antonio Water Company when they're available to us because it's a it's something that we then enjoy forever. You know, as long as the company has water, we have a right to that portion of our or our, our allocation of that water. Um, 
So uh, the other thing that, um, the other ways that we get this type of water is, you know, when I, in the wintertime, when I see snow on the mountain, I get this joy. When I see rain, I get joy. But I, 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 I reflect back in my youth and I go, well, can we go skiing or, or is that, not, you know, that makes me happy. And then I look at it and I go, it's a time release capsule. So it gets to, it's like, gets to melt and it continues to give that uh, source of water to, to us as a community. So I'm always happy when we have a Chamber of Commerce Day and the mountains are snow capped. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I wanted to go back here again to this map that's important and show you our treatment. That was our water treatment plant right here at the base of the, the dam. And back in the, this dam was built in the, in the 50s to protect the community, the downstream communities from flooding. There were uh, really bad years where a lot of property damage occurred because there wasn't any kind of flood management uh, facility there. So we like the dam because it, ca it stops the water from coming down and protects us, but it also gives us an opportunity to recharge that water in our spreading grounds. And Pomona Valley Protective Association was formed back in uh, 1910. Uh, the city of Upland is a member agency of Pomona Valley Protective Association, along with the cities of Pomona, Golden State Water Company, so San Antonio Water Company, West End Consolidated Water Company. And their mission, and they're written in the adjudication for the six basins, is to capture and spread water in the spreading ground for percolation so that the communities that are served by the six basins enjoy that water supply. So that's their mission. And the city of Upland, the, the five uh, water treatment and supply guys, they're out running around in the spreading grounds when we have rain and we have water in the channel that we can divert to both the San Bernardino side and the LA side. They're monitoring and managing those gates and doing that, performing that operation for a PVPA. Um, so, so Rosemary, does the water get treated there and then go somewhere to be stored before it comes to us as the consumer? All of the water that we serve to our customers in the city of Upland is treated mm -hmm. in, to different levels. But I would say the treatment uh, that we use for groundwater is uh, basically disinfection, so it's a chlorination treatment. But so every water, whether it's imported, um, surface water or groundwater gets that disinfection component, but groundwater only really needs that disinfection component before we serve it to customers. The surface water that we receive has to go through a treatment process, so we want to take out any particulates that are in it, we want to make sure that it's filtered and, um, and it's disinfected before it comes to our customers. And it's all tested along the way to make sure that it uh, is suitable. Uh, Councilman, or Mayor Pro Tem yes. you blend it. Do you blend it all together and distribute it to the city, or is it is there some way that, like some parts of Upland, get more of the San Antonio water? Company? Sure, sure. Because our 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 water system, and I didn't put that slide in. I I thought it was a little busy, but our our um, water system is divided in because we were. We were, um, our city as a whole has a pretty good gradient to it. There's about a 3% fall from the top of the city to the bottom of the city. Um, we have to be, we have to have uh, different water pressure zones. So in the city of Upland, there are five water pressure zones, and each one of those zones has different sources of supply. So if you happen to be near the treatment plant and we're running, 14 million gallons of water from the WFA water treatment plant, and you're living near that plant, you're gonna more than likely get that imported water supply. If you're located on the north end of the city and we're running the small water, surface water treatment plant that we have, you're probably getting that canyon water. And then our wells are distributed in the city, so you could be getting a little bit of well water. And remember that water's gonna go where the demand is. So it's going to move around the system where people want, want it or need it. Um, we also have about 50 million gallons of storage in storage reservoirs around the city. And so 
when the, those storage reservoirs act to meet our, our daily demands, and then at night we might replenish them so they're ready for the next day. So they do that, they, they uh, uh, serve as an operating capacity, they serve for fire flow and for emergency purposes. But you could have a blend of water um, in, in any uh, part of the city. Thank you. And I wanted to show this. This is off of the San Antonio Dam. This is, look, this is a picture from this year. Uh, the fact that we're able to um, divert from this location water out of the San Antonio Channel that's coming out from behind the dam that I showed you earlier. And we're able to turn it out into the San Bernardino side of the spreading grounds and the Los Angeles side of the spreading grounds so that this water can percolate into our groundwater aquifer. And it's very, this is a very um, uh, porous uh, soil, can, soil material. We, you can, we did percolation tests here. You can perk three feet a day. It's really, really uh, fast. And as you can see this year, um, through March, we have um, recharged 4,000 acre feet of stormwater, natural stormwater in the spreading grounds. And this month, we um, recharged about, I think, 2,000 additional acre feet. That's not reflected in this chart. So that's, this is really good. This has been a good year. Um, when we first started getting rain, it was so dry, the ground was so dry that we didn't see any, any um, water coming out from behind the dam because it was just soaking in the ground behind the dam. Well, you, Council you, divert, yeah. you divert water into the LA side. What's that? You mentioned that you diverted it into the LA County side. Yes. So how does that? Is that are we able to re take take that water back, or is that used? Well, it all goes into the it all goes into the the groundwater aquifer, and then it it's actually for us, of course, it's it's probably preferable on the San Bernardino side versus the LA side. But this whole area replenishes the wells that we have downstream, and it's beneficial to the city of Auckland. We have wells that are located on the south side of 16th Street between uh, Benson and the freeway, and so that's just right in the direct line of. How's it? How's it water. determined who gets what? Well, it's adjudicated. So in the judgment that the court-approved judgment, each party gets a certain amount of uh, percentage of the safe yield for that year. When I showed you in that earlier slide, the safe yield under the judgment is 19,300. But today, the capacity that's available to the people who are parties to the judgment are only 13,000. And it's divided up amongst their right, I guess, if you will, um, to that water. So, they, and, and what, when I say right, if you, they, there are uh, producers or there are agencies who don't have water rights and when they produce water out of adjudicated basins they're required to replenish that so they have to buy imported water to replenish the water they took out of the ground that they weren't really entitled to take out of the ground so that it makes the basin whole so you if you have a right that you got it you got an edge against somebody who doesn't have a right um, like Fontana Water Company, for example, doesn't have rights to produce water out of the Chino Basin, but they do produce water, and so they have, are obligated to replace that water that they produce. Uh, weir structure up in the canyon that um, divides the water that comes down the canyon, and 60% of that water goes to San Antonio Water Company, and 40% of that water goes to Pomona. And um, so there, so the stream has been adjudicated in that manner. Yeah. That would be the when you talk about going to Pomona, that would be the difference between the LA County, San Bernardino County split that we're kind of seeing here. Yeah. Right? Well, maybe. I mean, I guess you could look at it that way. But there's a pipeline that Pom the city of Pomona has that comes down out of the from behind the dam and goes across the spreading grounds and goes to a treatment plant they have called the Pedley plant. Okay. And then the, at the Pedley plant, they either treat it and serve it, or they recharge it, and they get credit for that recharge. Thank you. So is it fair to say that Claremont also has use of that LA side of water? Um, Claremont uh, doesn't have uh, water shares. They don't aren't a water purveyor. Um, they they, uh, they they're served by Golden State Water Company. 
So they might have back in the day, but the, today they don't have a water company. In fact, a few years ago, you may have read in the paper that they were trying to get the, the water um, system back from Golden State Water, and there was a big lawsuit that they were unsuccessful um, with, with. And so, you know, they're still served by Golden State Water Company, who's a public utility, who is um, regulated by the Public Utility Commission, which is a different kind of regulation structure than the city of Upland. So they have no access to that at all? Uh, no, the, the, you have to have a right to be able to, to um, you know, yeah. produce it. Rosemary, when I had met with um, Jeanette Bagnosi regarding the water fund, there was a spike in income that I didn't understand. Uh -huh. And she told me that was because we had excess water that we sold to the city of Montana. Yes. So can you kind of explain how that works? Sure, sure. Um, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, in some of the basins, you're, um, they do a operating safe field every year. And like in the six basins, only 25% of the prior year's allocation can be carried over into the following year. And that water has to be used immediately or first water used in the following year. And then you work, in, you work on your new allocation. In the Chino Basin, it's a large aquifer that's like, I think the six basins would be maybe 300,000 acre feet. The Chino Basin is like 5 million acre feet big, and the safe yield for the Chino Basin is, was, was 140,000 acre feet a year, and it's dropped to 135,000 <coughs> acre feet a year. But if you don't you produce your rights in the Chino Basin, you're able to, to store them. And the spike in income was because the city of Upland leased some water it had in storage to Fontana Water Company because, as I mentioned earlier, Fontana Water Company does not have any rights in the basin. And so they have to replenish the water that they produce out of the basin. So they either have to buy it from somebody else, you know, through a transfer, through a paper transfer, or they have to take they have to buy imported water and recharge it into the ground to make the to make the Chino Basin whole for their production that they don't have a right to. So that's how we generated revenue, and we were able to sell that water um, at a at a at a kind of a benchmarked rate to Metropolitan's water because of the the options that are available to Fontana for that replenishment obligation. Does Claremont have to do the same thing? If they don't not, if they don't have water rights, do they have to make make things whole? If they because they have wells, I know. Yeah, the um, Claremont doesn't provide water to their customers directly. The Golden State Water Company services the Claremont area, so uh, uh, Golden State would be the purveyor. But where do they do they they have rights in the six basins and other areas okay so, so they, they have water rights they do have to rights. produce yeah but they don't have any rights to the san antonio dam water well there that's the water that um is behind the dam is this is san antonio water company and pomona's water that's the water if they're if san antonio water company and pomona can't utilize that water and it flows through the dam and into the spreading grounds it becomes water that is used to replenish the six basins aquifer that there are uh, parties that have been identified that are entitled to that water so that's how golden state gets their their um, access to that water that's how the city of upland and so on and so forth gets access to that water. Now if we have a big storm and I see stream go, I hike the uh, Thompson Creek Trail there, and so in a big storm there's a lot of water running down there, but I haven't seen much of that lately because of the, the, uh, the drought conditions. Mm -hmm. So any water that's in that storm uh, thing, that's lost, right? That water gets replenished. In, in the, which storm? Well, it's, it's a channel that goes down on the north side of Claremont from that dam. Yeah, so that's the San, that's this channel right here, San Antonio Canyon, or San Antonio Channel. It's an Army Corps facility, and we have turnouts. Like, there, the where how we divert water out of that channel into these spreading grounds is because there's a drop structure 
that the water cascades into and then we have gates that we open up and that allows us to take that water and spread it in these, into these ponds here. These ponds actually, they're big mining pits when there's a lot of water that, I mean, these aren't that big uh, percolation ponds, but when we, when we ex exceed the capacity of these percolation ponds, the water's diverted around them and goes to large aggregate mining uh, pits that uh, exist today, and that's where the water's percolated. So um, I don't have a picture of that, but um, those are very large uh, facilities that can capture that water, and all of that water is captured above the 210 freeway, which is good for, for upland. There's a big hole uh, wet, uh, east of the Claremont Colleges, um, and, uh, and I, I think it's a shame we don't have a way of storing water in that. Yeah, that belongs to the colleges, and they have plans to put a sports park there. Sports complex. Sports complex. Sports complex. So they've sports already complex. got entitlements <laughs> to build um, uh, like a sports state, sports complex facility there, but directly to the east of that are water, uh, our Chino Basin water conservation um, recharge pits, and to the south, on the south side of Arrow, Arrow and east of Monte Vista is a city facility called the Upland Basin, and that's a very large stormwater capture and recharge facility that will capture. Um, about a thousand seventy acre feet of water when it's available, and if it if it it's two two one hundred year back to back storms in terms of flood management, and it has a couple hundred acre feet of dead storage or um, you know non flood related storage. So Rosemary, when there's a big rain and all the water comes pouring down Euclid and Mountain. <laughs> yeah. Where does that water go? Well, we try to catch it. You know, yeah, if you might recall, I don't know how long you've lived in the area, but there was a there was a big project that was done by the uh, in cooperation with the flood control district that built a large diameter pipeline down Eighth Street, so over to Euclid and down and then east on Eighth Street, um, and that what that does is there was a lot of torrential rains that came down. Um, and that pipe uh, captures a lot of that water and conveys it over to an 8th Street basin, another recharge basin over by 7th Street, or eight, maybe it's 8th Street, and uh, east of like 11th Avenue, 13th Avenue, um, kind of near the southeast corner of the city. And so it goes into that pit, it's able to recharge there and whatever if there's more water that goes there than the capacity of that, then it cascades down to the next, into a channel and down to the next recharge pit. So the region has invested millions and millions of dollars in capture facilities because they're, it's important for flood control and it's important for groundwater recharge. How does the 8th Street hole in the ground there give us any water it's a block from Ontario it, it gives it it doesn't really give it to upland per se no, it, it gives Ontario. it to Ontario yeah. but because it's because it's downstream of us all the water under the ground is traveling in a southwesterly direction so it goes in like, like let's say all this water that's being recharged here doesn't stay at the top of the dam it starts traveling in a southwesterly uh, direction under the ground until it gets to the end of the aquifer. And then it might go into a river, like the Santa Ana River. So it's the, the water's on the move. And you see a wave, we see a wave in our wells. Remember I told you the wells weren't producing, they were on a timer. Well, with the rain, now they're, we can run them 24 hours a day. Well, when that wave of water passes, then that um, production capacity could diminish again, because it's all part of that cycle. So we don't have any of these catch things like eighth up higher? Only, the only areas that we have for recharge um, within the city really are on the westerly and the easterly flanks of the city. Um, this in the San, Anto or San, uh, San, uh, San Antonio Spreading Grounds area. And then let me flip to the next page. This is the Cucamonga. Uh, Crosswalls project that was, thank goodness, finished right before we got these tremendous rains. And so you see how that's the receiving the water, it's ponding and it's cascading and it's ponding and it's, you know, so on and so forth. There's a few breaches here, but 
it's we're, what we're trying to do there is capture that water and put it in the ground because we have we have uh, we have rights to a west end well that's located in the space and that's how we get our rights and then San Antonio Water Company has production rights in the Cucamonga Basin and uh, Cucamonga Valley Water District our neighbor has rights to produce out of this basin as well. So how does the and, and we also have in the colonies. Hit, right? Yes, that's a that's Another. the colonies has a has a recharge component. We we have big storm rains that come in uh, off of campus, discharge storm water into the colonies basin, and the and that basin is owned by the San Bernardino County Flood Control District. They have three segments of that basin. The first part of that basin is to take the water from the storm drain and kind of calm it down a little bit. The next chamber is a, a wetlands feature, so it cleans the water up naturally. And then the third uh, third uh, chamber is a recharge component. And that was done years ago to protect you, the north part of town, because anybody who grew up around here, it used to be it flood Euclid Avenue. You couldn't even come down Euclid Avenue. You couldn't come down San Antonio. Well, you couldn't come down Mountain. It, exactly. And when the freeway went through, uh, Caltrans was required to make sure that they intercepted that water yeah, and that right. and managed it. And they sent it uh, a good portion of it over to the to the um, Colonies Basin, if you will, which is a flood control facility. And then on the west side of the city, it sent it to that the San Antonio spreading ground. So there's a pipeline that goes out 20th Street to those big pits that I was talking about. Oops, sorry, where is this one? Um, this is the Cucamonga crosswalls. Um, so I, this this slide just shows you by source, you know how. Um, if you take an average of 2013 through 2018, where our water supply comes uh, from, and these are this is the key down here. So, from city uh, sources, city well, groundwater wells, um, we we take about 17 percent. Recycled water is three percent. You know, again, about 800 acre feet a year. Um, our WFA is 31 percent, and I think the reason we're We've got that high percentage is because it's been really dry, and so when we lose capacity in our local groundwater supply, we have to take water from imported so sources of supply to meet the demand of the community. So that's an important source of um, supply for, for us, and, and it is essential in the summer that we have access to that imported water supply because we wouldn't otherwise be able to meet demands um, that we have in the city without it. Which is why when we ask, sometimes they'll shut it down, we ask you, we ask the community to conserve. And the community is very responsive in, in making sure they're using that water wisely to allow us to get through some kind of tight times. And then we have the West End, what we get from West End. And then you can see San Antonio is another significant source of water supply on an average, you know, over, over the course of the year. Yes? It's the southeast corner of 16th and Benson. 16th and first. Yes. Is that a pumping station where those were the businesses that did yes. well there? It's so a it's a Lemon Heights, it's Lemon Heights well number four, and it's a West End consolidated water company facility. Right. And, and it, its function is just it's a pumping station. So it's correct? a pumping <coughs> station. And quite honestly, the West West End Consolidated Water Company provides irrigation water to the city. We have a well on the um, southeast side of Benson and 16th Street, and then we have three wells to the west on the south side of 16th Street. All of those wells pump into a pipeline that takes it up to that reservoir we were talking about, right. along with the city well 17. So all that water is going into a pipeline that goes up to that reservoir um, and, is, and is treated at that reservoir along with imported water before it gets distributed to the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so this is another way of representing that, but it also shows it by year. Um, and, it's, and you see then the different sources of supply. And what's notable here is in 2015 is when the governor declared the drought, statewide drought, and he, and as part of that declaration, the city of Upland was mandated to reduce its water 
water consumption by 36 percent. And we were, uh, we, and the community, I would say, and I'm very grateful for this, it was responsive to that call to conserve water. We didn't get it the first month, but the second, and we got a notice of violation from the state saying you didn't meet your 36 percent reduction, but the second month of that, after that declaration was issued, the city of Upland met that 36 percent reduction. Um, and that's why you see that big dip uh, in water use within the community. That did a couple things though for us is our, our water rate structure is dependent on how much water the community serves. We had just completed a water rate adjustment analysis in 2014 that was assuming these types of water uses or water, water demand within the system. And, when, and our rate structure is based on a standby charge that's based on the size of your meter every month. So whether you use water or you don't, you pay a rate for having access to water. And then how much water you use. And for most, in our, in our residential rate structure is built into three tiers a baseline tier, a middle tier, and a, and a higher use tier. Um, but when we had this significant drop in, um, in water use, our expenses went down, but our revenue went down significantly. And it was in, and all the purveyors, like San Antonio Water Company, and they were all affected in the same manner. So the cost of their water went up, our revenue went down, so it, went, it created this big gap and we were able to overcome that a little bit by, by leasing some water to another agency that um, lost a little bit of that lost revenue. And what you see here is you see, now that most people feel like we're not in a drought, even though we still have local conditions that are drought-like, you see a little bit of rebound on, on that um, demands within the system. We haven't had that much growth, but you're seeing a little bit of a bounce back. In fact, um, this, if you, and I think uh, Councilman Belto, he was here, we looked at this, these predate, you know, go back to like 1995 usage. I mean, if you look at historic usage in the city, this, this uh, demand. So I think it's kind of interesting to see that and, you know, the assumptions that we need to make based upon the data that we have available. Um, Here's the WFA that we were talking about earlier, uh, Water Facilities Authority Agua de Leos Treatment Plant. Again, we own 22% of this water treatment plant. We were, it was built as a Joint Powers Authority. This, the water that we receive here is water that is provided by Lake Silverwood through the MWD system. And it comes from the state uh, MWD is a uh, contractor with the state on the state project water. So that water that comes down to Silverwood comes from Northern California um, and it travels a long way to get here. Um, and then it's treated at this plant um, and that we have up on 17th Street in Benson. And if people are interested in touring that plant, the general manager who manages that facility would be welcome to, she takes students and you know he takes interested people um, through the plant and shows them how the, how, how the plant operates. Is that the Feather River? <coughs> yes. Yeah. Oops. Let me go back. So here's a bird's eye view of that plant. Again it's you know our little plant is six million at the top of the dam. This is an 81, uh, 81 million gallon a day uh, water treatment plant facility. And uh, again the pipeline that serves it comes from uh, Lake Silverwood, and it's a, uh, I think it's a 12, like a 12 foot diameter pipe that runs under 18th Street, kind of, to the plant. So it runs across town. Does that pipe go on to San Dimas? Yes, it goes, you know, the next treatment plant, there's a treatment plant in Cucamonga Valley, there's our treatment plant, there's a Three Valleys treatment plant to cross in the LA side, and then it continues, continues that direction. Um, so, I mean, it's really a, a part, important part of the, the network. So I wanted to get back to daily, I wanted to get back to water demands within the city, and I think this chart, this um, information is kind of important because 
If you look at our minimum day flows, these would be demands that we have in the winter time. It's 7.2 million gallons a day of water demand in the winter time, but in the summertime, we're talking about 25.7 million gallons a day of water required. The difference between those two numbers is what you put outside in your landscape. It's outside, it's outside irrigation. So there's lots of opportunities to save water uh, by changing your landscaping in, in, into um, landscaping that's, that's not unattractive, but uses less water and more uh, climate appropriate, if you will. So I, I wanted to point that out to you. And then secondly, I wanted to point out that in the summertime for about three to four months out of the year, we, we take 14 million gallons of water a day out of the WFA, that water imported water treatment plant. And without that water treatment plant, we wouldn't be able to meet these, these community demands. Um, we, with our local resources. We couldn't turn on every well that we had in the city and provide our customers with the water that they need to meet the summer, summer demand. Yes? I have a question. With the anticipated, I would say, 5,000 more households, possibly 10,000 more households and up and over the next 5 to 12 years, mm -hmm. where we're going to get the water to service all these new people? Well, we have the water. We, we're not fully utilizing our imported water supply. I mean, we have, we have planned for those water, um, water demands as part of our general plan. I mean, and the new housing stock that's coming on board is really ultra efficient. Everything in that building, everything in that new uh, product that's being uh, delivered in, uh, uh, in new housing stock that's coming online is using high efficiency toilets, high efficiently see sprinkler heads. They're not able to put out turf in the front yard or very minimally. The way they landscape's got to be drip irrigation. I mean, they're using a lot, lot less water than your older home uses in the community. So. I mean, you know, it was discussed a few years ago with the new football field being built by Claremont Colleges yeah. using city, our city water and possibly paying for it. Yeah. I, I, still, I still have a problem with, Which, if, can we go up to 35 million gallons a day? Well, I, we, we, we've never been to 35 and we'll, we'll never be at 35. Mm -hmm. We will never be there, even, even with the growth that we have. Yeah. So you're just hoping that these five or ten thousand houses don't use more than a couple hundred gallons a day for toilets and, and uh, they're they're very efficient. They're, in fact, what they're doing to your rates is they're improving your rate structure because they're spreading spreading the cost out with the with less water usage. Oh, also so, less less, so more, it's, less it's, ones and properties. It's beneficial to to you as a rate payer to have those. Um, products online plus it's somebody owns that property they want to develop it they have a right to develop it but we have we a general be, plan should we be drilling more wells now yes we should right exactly. we absolutely should and we should be doing that because we want to uh, continue to develop our resiliency to be able to provide uh, water on all different kind in all different manners we want to increase our ability or our flexibility and how we um, uh, supply water to our customers. Well, seventeen percent of the city wells providing our, our water supply. If let's say we had a major contamination issue, and that seventeen percent dropped to zero percent. Yeah, could we would other, be taking more imported water. We, we, it, we it, would be taking imported water. Absolutely. Yeah. To follow up on that. Do we, as the city, have the ability to drill additional wells, or do we have to? Would we have to rely upon? Antonio water. No, we can we can drill wells. We're just finding the right spot to drill them. You know, and, and drilling those wells, not only drilling those wells, but you have to also consider that the groundwater is not in all places is not pristine. So if you drill a well you might have to add a treatment uh, processes along with it. So it kind of comes both. And there's some expense associated with that. But I think it's important to have that uh, ability to have uh, more local water supply so you're not so dependent on imported and we'll get to that in a minute the reason why that's important 
So anyway, I just wanted to show you a little bit and explain the importance of imported water during the summer months when we see the higher demands three, four months out of the year, or sometimes five months out of the year. Again, it depends on how hot it's been. This year we've had a lot of rain and people have been good about turning their water off and not irrigating when it's raining. You know, that's against a city code. We're not allowed to do that, but you still see it happen from time to time within the community. But most people are mindful of that. They know we live in Southern California and we need to be cognizant of our resources. So, so we talked a little bit about the governor's declaration of a drought. And these are kind of time series maps, a drought monitor. And again, it's statewide information. So in 2015, Northern California was experiencing dry, real super dry conditions and a lot of water is generated in Northern California uh, just because it naturally rains more up there. And I think they don't have as many storage, they aren't as resilient as we are in Southern California because we're constantly thinking about, you know, making sure we have enough water supply so we have a lot of diversification if we can but it really impacts communities that haven't really had those, you know, need for that storage because they always get rain and this and that, you know. So it's more pronounced, I think, in those areas that think they com could be comfortable. Um, but as you see, the map changed over time. In 2017, we had our first big, big water year. I mean, I have to go back and look at the precipitation. But that year we got big water, we didn't get a lot of recharge because it was just soaking into the ground, the surface, the plants, everything. We're like, well, finally we're going to rain, you know? <laughs> and now we're having 40 inches of rain, and so the statewide perspective and the snow in 2017, the other thing is in Northern California, they got lots of snowpack, they got lots of water, you know, so that changes the whole picture. Um, and so that's why you see on the, um, on the, in the 2019 day uh, data that California, is only in the very southern, southern portion of California is in some kind of a drier condition. But it's not true because you look at the, the information I gave you earlier about how our aquifers have dropped down and are, are, are very low. I mean, we need to have more rain. We need to have more years like this year to replenish the water that we've drawn out of our reserve bank account. So Mary, could you share with them that how over the years having more homes has been able to use less water because of going from agriculture to residential property? Uh, Can you share that with us from the Chino Valley Basin Group? Yeah, there, there's a number of things that have um, occurred uh, over the years, you know, that have impacted um, impacted our uh, water supply. I mean, back in the day, most of this valley was agriculture, okay? So when it rained, there was a lot of, uh, in, a lot of pervious material for that rain, for that rain to, 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 um, to touch and percolate into the ground. Today, we have a lot of urbanized areas, and so you have more runoff, which, which requires us to have these recharge basins to capture that runoff, to put it back in the ground. And then we have channels that used to be earthen channels that are now concrete channels that convey that water away for flood management purposes. But we say, hey, wait, don't take that water from us. Put it, let's, let's put rubber. So in the San Antonio channel that we talked about on the west side of the city, they have rubber dams that um, we can erect in the, in the wintertime or in the summertime to, to take storm water in, in the wintertime to take it into these um, big flood control basins. And in the summertime, we can put imported water in there, and, and with the dam, we can divert it into the basins and recharge the ground. So there's a lot of that going. But I think back to your point about the housing stock, I mean, it's just the, the new homes that are being built today because of all the uh, requirements for being um, compliant with efficient efficient models, you're seeing you can have more people in an area and use a lot less water to and still meet, you know, the community's needs. So I don't know if that answered your question, but the one of the initiatives that is occurring right now is we Chino Basin or Inland Empire Utility Agency was able to get was able to get a grant, a grant for 
$207 million of infrastructure improvements within the Inland Empire. We talked about all the millions of dollars that have been spent doing these recharge basins. Well, there's a project where they, they, can, they got a grant so they can build infrastructure and maybe create some um, interconnections and reliability within this region. But, you know, part of that is also getting off metropolitan water when they want to um, discharge that water to the Feather River, like the gentleman mentioned earlier, so that the fish and the habitat up there can be sustained. So it's a combination of things going on um, that have brought some potential grant money, and the project's not completed now, but also some potentially needed improvements to this area as well. And that's currently under development. Um, I wanted to show this slide because, we, as we all know, the San Andreas Fault runs up and down the state of California in the mountains, and we're very close to the mountains and, and the San Andreas Fault, and so we're always subject to potential seismic events. Um, we haven't seen the big one yet, and hopefully not, we won't see the big one anytime soon, but that imported water supply that we're reliant on in the summer months is, is uh, conveyed through a canal that crosses the San Andreas Fault uh, on, on, on several locations. So there's a potential that under a very large seismic event, the imported water supply to Southern California could be disrupted for many, many months including the summer season when we're reliant on that kind of water um, or imported water supply. And, and I'm not trying to create a gloom and doom. You know, this is not unique to Upland. This is, this is a, a fact of life to everybody who gets imported water from Northern California, every agency along that um, pipeline and in this region that gets imported water supply. But that's why it's important that we develop additional groundwater production wells and even if it requires some treatment that needs to be added to it so that we have that um, local access to local water supply. I mean, it's inevitable, it, well I shouldn't say that, it's highly probable that we will have some kind of an event on the San Andreas Fault. But Rosemary, I know we have a lot of gravity fed um, water pressure. If we lost our complete electrical grid, would we have water? We would have water as long as we have storage. We, you know, but when the storage runs out, these storage reservoirs that we have, all right, it's 50 million gallons of storage that's operating um, fire flow and emergency. That's not going to take you very long. If you think 50 million gallons and you're using 25 million gallons a day, well, <laughs> do the math. Do, do your pumps have any backup uh, generators? Yes, we have generators and we're in the process of purchasing some additional generators so that to put on facilities. So we're we're, we have existing ones in place, but we also need to get some additional um, facilities so that when the power does go out, and um, Southern California Edison actually, I don't know if, you, if any of you received that notice, but they have this wildfire thing now, mm -hmm. and they can pretty much whenever they, whenever they feel a wind event um, is coming and it uh, could potentially compromise their uh, grid, they can turn it off. And, they, and that impacts our facilities. So, you know, it can be something as simple as that that shuts off the power, that doesn't allow us to pump, run a well or a, a, facility, or a booster station because we have five pressure zones and we have to move water, you know, up and down and across, you know, in our system, you know, to serve everybody's needs. So, so those are all issues, are all things that we think about and plan um, as part of our, our program. Yes, sir. My understanding is uh, Diamond Valley Lake was built partially to handle the issue of disruption from earthquakes. And I was told that that could supply MWP water for a number of months, even if all Colorado River, Feather River, and everything else was cut off. Yeah, Diamond Valley uh, Lake is a, is a really important asset. Um, I don't know that Diamond Valley Lake, because of where it's geographically located relative to the city of Upland, 
provides us with that much benefit. But oh, okay. but there but there are opportunities to make adjustments within the metropolitan system to uh, maybe move, like we don't have any access to Colorado River water. Okay. But maybe somebody else takes Colorado River water and allows you know Northern California water to come you know and so they make adjustments in that manner. Um, but it's a big, it's a big grid, and that Diamond Valley Lake was an important part of having emergency water supplies um, in the Southern California area. It's another reason why the Chino Basin project that I talked about earlier, that's currently being developed, is um, an important project in that you know Metropolitan Water District has the ability to store 100,000 acre feet of imported water in the Chino Basin that if the supply was disrupted, they could call on the various agencies to produce that water um, in lieu of getting imported water supply. But you have to have the facilities to pump it out of the ground. And, and you have to have, make sure that it meets the right water quality standards as well. So you might have to have treatment associated with that. So. Um. Last year, I attended a lecture at JPL by a climatologist who said that we're at a point now where we aren't going to be able to rely on the mountains to be our snow reservoir mm -hmm. that will give us our summer water supply. So his suggestion was that the state needed to be building like gangbusters, hundreds of new reservoirs and dams up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's any local agency moving to do that with our local mountains? Or? Uh, no, I do not. Um, I do not think that, I mean, those are big public projects like the Diamond Valley Lake that was uh, constructed not too long ago, I don't know, maybe it was a 10, 10, 15 years ago that Diamond Valley Lake got built. That was a huge project, a huge undertaking. Those types of projects require a lot of environmental review um, and then the funding associated with that. Um, there may be projects like that occurring in Northern California. I'm not aware of any here in Southern California uh, where, where that is being undertaken. The one big project to uh, provide some reliability to the Southern California region that um, is, is being advanced forward, albeit maybe curtailed back a little bit, is the California Water Fix, which was originally intended to build two tunnels across the Delta, which is an area of Northern California that has um, the potential for seawater intrusion and it also has these earthen levees and so under a seismic event we most people feel like that area of California is very vulnerable to failure and so the California water fix was intended to uh, in, intended to benefit the environment up there and also to be able to provide a more reliable source of water to Southern California uh, the governor, I think, recently um, uh, took a look at that project and said, "We're not going to build two tunnels. We're going to we're going to think about maybe building one tunnel." But that in project in itself has a lot of um, analysis and environmental permitting and uh, permit requirements. That's going to take years and years and years to uh, complete and a lot of money um, to complete. But it is something that Metropolitan Water District is committed to to advance that project forward. Yes? Um, that's actually sort of a little bit related. I was just listening to a, a presentation last night um, about some of the same issues. And um, they were. he was also talking about sort of our failing infrastructure and mentioned San Antonio Dam has like a two out of five rating, um, like safety rating from the Army Corps of Engineers, like it, it could basically fail? Um, it's, uh, San Antonio Dam is an earthen dam, so it, and it, it I, I would say it's probably a pretty safe facility, I mean the way uh, the Army Corps operates it, but it isn't, it isn't, um, uh, I guess, there's always a potential for failure for the facility. Yeah, I so, mean, I think you know that. I think their their point was just aging infrastructure in general, and because of just the volatility that you know, climate change is producing, and you know, we're just he was talking about sort of like 
we're just going to be vacillating between these two two extremes of you know yeah. extended drought periods and then huge amounts of water where you know the system can't handle can't well, the infrastructure can't handle it. Well, that's the that's the science is that we're going to see hotter, longer periods and we're going to see wetter, faster periods. And so it's our charge to be able to capture as much of that wet water as possible. But if we don't have that infrastructure in place, obviously it's going to pass by and go to the ocean. But you know, we we are working to again develop um, develop uh, methodologies and, and um, practices like storing water in ground in the groundwater for emergency periods of time to help overcome some of that climate change. Um, uh, uh, condition that is anticipated in the future. I mean, we don't know that. That's projected. We don't know if it's going to happen or not. Right, wasn't there uh, some talk a couple years ago that San Antonio Dam wasn't even going to be used as a dam? It was strictly going to be converted to a county's park. Oh, I don't know. I, I wasn't here back in that day. It was a couple years ago that they're not even going to use it for a dam. I mean, well, it is a flood, con it is a flood management. So not using it for the purpose of back in 69, that water was up. Uh, it was in well, <laughs> you know that you know that the mountains there is a um, national monument area. I think Obama declared a national monument and that kind of thing. But that doesn't change the purpose of San Antonio Canyon Dam, which is for flood management purposes. That's its that's its primary uh, primary purpose is to protect the downstream communities and there's big there's big I've been down in the inside of that dam it's quite interesting the giant gates that they have to open the oh, that can open up and and allow water to be discharged into the channel so they had a bunch of earth movers up there probably about five to seven years ago when they cleaned the bottom of it out they moved all of it you know they re redirected a lot of that you know over towards the colonies is that what they did back in the day not um, from San Antonio Dam that I'm aware of. But um, what I will say is that San Antonio Canyon Dam, sometimes the reason why we can't recharge water is there's a stilling pool behind the dam that water has to collect and get to a certain elevation before it even can enter the channel right. and be diverted into the spreading grounds for that purpose. So um, I, I, I don't, I'm, not, uh, cons no, I'm, I'm not alarmed by uh, he seemed very alarmed. But he seemed, he, you know, like on the on the scale, it was, you know, really? low grade. It was it was considered unsafe. Now. Wow. Yeah. So and what I mean, his point was that you know the the water districts and you know all the different jurisdictions need to you know put some pressure on our congressional delegation to allocate some money to, yeah. to fix the infrastructure. Well, I think aging infrastructure is a problem uh, in every community and across the state. And, you know, these large infrastructure, I don't, I don't think that there has been any significant um, uh, upgrades to the dam facility since it was originally built. I mean, there may be little stuff, but, um, you know, even you know, within our own communities, the pipelines are aging. You know, the storage reservoirs need to be uh, maintained uh, and replaced in some cases because they're not up to standard. I mean, it's a constant reinvestment to continue to keep the uh, system in a condition that provides reliable service to the community. Um, Rosemary, who, I'm sorry, who, who's responsible for the dam? Who originally put the state? The Army Corps of Engineers. It's their facility and they operate it. Nobody else operates it but the Corps. And there's an orange book, there's an operating manual that's associated with that. I mean, so I, and you know, they'll, they'll, they're, the, they're um, the U.S. government, I guess, so maybe there's some money they can get. <laughs> well, that's, that was his point about, you know, we need to put, like, pressure on, on the Congress, congressional delegation, to, to take care of that problem, it's yeah. a federal issue. It didn't work on since 2000. How many feet of water is behind that dam today? Um, there's enough water that it's spilling into San Antonio Channel and we're able to reach. So it's up to the top of the dam? No, 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 no. No, no, no. no it's not. A few years ago, in 2010, there was a lot of water behind the dam. In fact, it rose quite a bit overnight just because, because there was snow 
snow on the mountains and we got a tropical storm. So that melted the snow and so the snow and the rain combined. Well, do you remember about oh, a year or so ago when they were evacuating the houses in, in um, Corona with that Prado Dam when they said it was going to fall apart? Yeah, I heard um, about it, but I, I don't know too yeah. much about that. Um, now, is, but San Antonio, has that dam recently ever been to capacity? Or it's, not that I'm aware of. So yeah. I mean, I, I don't see. You know, I, yeah. There probably is a hazard there, but I don't see it being a major. Yeah. If it did uh, breach, how much? What would happen? I mean, we would uh, we would start emergency services, absolutely. Right. You know, <laughs> evacuations and everything. Uh, Councilman Zuniga. What about uh, fire flow? Is our usage of back that? Uh, we in the in the in the um, reservoirs that we have, we have capacity set aside for fire flow. So we look at the reservoir and, and the area that it serves, depending on whether it's residential or commercial and industrial, it has different uh, fire flow capacity requirements. We also look at uh, fire flow when we're analyzing our system to make sure the pipelines are of sufficient size to meet um, those fire flow conditions. Well, that is question. Me. What's the um, average age of our pipeline, of our infrastructure, and what's the condition of it? Um, you know, we're a we, snapshot. Yeah, I, I, I don't have that statistic on the top of my head, but the uh, city of Upland is an aging community, and we've estimated that there's, you know, there are pipelines within the city that, you know, we need to start thinking about replacing. I think it goes back to shape these days, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are older parts. You can look at, just to get a feel for it, you can look at the age of the housing stock and then kind of make an idea of, you know, the pipeline age, age within the community. Are they at LA status? Were they going to burst every year? Yeah, right. Well, I hope not. That our, goal, our goal is to, to not be like LA and yes. you know, have, um, it's have interruptions. Least, yeah, it's almost like a yeah, so that's that would be our goal is to keep um, water supply reliability high in the city of Auckland. Uh, how many patches a week would you say your people do on water main uh, um, leaks? You know, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. A few I mean, maybe. They're out there all the time. I know, yeah, I constantly see yeah. them digging holes and putting a, a, so, a quote, patch. Yeah, so, well, that might be a pothole. <laughs> so, so does that, um, is our infrastructure being monitored as to say we're going to replace this pipeline because it's leaking this much and this older, or how do we do um, that? We have a, a water master plan that looks at the uh, uh, city's water infrastructure. It's looking at, the water master plan is looking at it more to make sure that we can achieve the fire flow requirements that we have, that we have enough water supply and storage, those elements, so it's modeled in that regard. Uh, one of the things that we, we need to do, um, and we don't have it today, is, is develop an asset inventory of our pipelines um, and even in, in include them in kind of a geographic information system. So we have information on our leaks and that kind of thing helps us make decisions about replacing pipelines plus age, material type, um, and again, the number of leaks that we've had on the system. We also try to be efficient in terms of if we have a road improvement project that we're going to undertake, we evaluate, is the infrastructure going to make it through the life cycle of that road? Um, or how far into it do we think it's going to be? And is it, is it prudent to, to make a replacement at this time before we pave that new road? Because that's a lot of money, too, to put in a street and then have um, a water line that starts leaking in a pothole and then the whole, starts that whole deterioration process. So, I mean, there's a lot of thought that goes into that, but we do need a condition assessment of assets and we need to lay that out in that manner. And are, we, are you doing that? Or we are, we're working that? on it. We're okay. working on it and we, we might bring something back to the council to help us um, develop that uh, asset inventory here in, in, a, in, a, in a little bit. In a, shortly, I guess if you will. Um, it's part of that is, I think, looking at it um, from a um, um, geographical information system and a database development. We have that for our road infrastructure. Right. We have a condition assessment of our roads. We need to go back and update that, but 
again, but we have one that we've done in the past that we've been using as a basis for uh, planning purposes. Um, just kind of want to give you guys some public service announcements. This is the close of my uh, presentation, but I wanted to invite you to our open house at Public Works. It's going to be on Saturday, from uh, Saturday, May 18th from 9 to 1 o'clock. We're going to have a number of our staff people there to help uh, tell you about what Public Works does and also answer any questions that you might have um, related to the public infrastructure, your trees, the water system. We, we have our um, telemetry room that you can see the screen that shows all our reservoirs and what's the status of them, whether a well's on or off. It's kind of interesting. Um, if you're a multitasker, you can come bring some of that stuff you have in your garage on Saturday, like the fertilizer or the paint and the old fuel that you've been meaning to get rid of and bring it to our household hazardous waste center, which is open during the period of the open house. Uh, and they'll take that for you free of charge. Um, if it's fuel that you want to get rid of that's old, they'll tag that can and then you can come back and pick the can up after they've um, disposed of the fuel properly. Used oil, fluorescent light bulbs, you know, something somebody in your household has said, why don't you clean this space up? You know, bring it to household hazardous waste. We're going to have a shredder there that'll be free for you. So if you've got some old tax returns or things that you've been meaning to shred one sheet at a time, you can bring a box and they'll take it and dispose of it for you without, um, you know, having to do it one sheet at a time. They'll take it, it it's all secure and um, uh, free for you. Uh, and then we have an opportunity if you want to do a little gardening around the yard, we have a mulch, free mulch you can pick up at the same time. You know, bring your trash can or your bag and you can, you can take it with you. And then again, stop by and see uh, our equipment and talk to our staff, have a hot dog or hamburger. We'll have some food for you too and we'll have some um, entertainment for the kids. We'll have a jumper and, and a slide and stuff that they can play on while you're maybe walking around talking to the staff. So I think it'll be really a fun event. I don't know, maybe I missed something, Michelle, about uh, Public Works Day. We had a lot of people who came last year and they loved it. Um, again, you can do it as just come to Public Works Day and spend a bit of time there, or you can multitask and get a few things accomplished while you're at the yard. You're going on, on vacation again that day like last year? No. Well, I was there though. I can't I I mean, show. And then I headed off to go on a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to announce the workshops that we have coming up for, for our, from our water conservation uh, person. Uh, Michelle Madrid, she's in the corner, she's lovely, she's friendly, she'll help you with all of your stuff. We have um, instructors that come to these uh, workshops and provide information to the public, they're all free. Um, they're a great time, it's something to do in the, in the... What's the time of day on those? Those are Saturdays. Well, they're Saturdays, and if you want more details, I would suggest that you, you call Michelle or call Public Works. They'll be able to give you the details on the time. They usually start about 9, right? 9 to 12. 9 to 12. 9 to 12. Is that right? 9 to 12. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, the turf removal right now, the city has an opportunity if you want to change that turf to something more climate friendly, you can get some money back from, um, uh, is that waterwise.com or through yeah, metropolitan.com? Yeah. So that's a great program. I know I did it myself at my house um, and I'm, just, I'm loving my water bill and I love my yard. I think it's, it's it's beautiful, and my neighbors love it. They were a little surprised at first, but they all love it now. So, um, anyway, these are some really great workshops that are coming up, and again, Michelle, Michelle is in the back. Um, I want to, if you're interested in our watershed, every year San Antonio Water Company, the City of Pomona, and the City of Upland host a watershed cleanup, and it's work, guys. I mean, I won't tell you it's not. You, they give you uh, some gloves, they give you a bag and a trash picker, and you go through this, the uh, area 
uh, up behind the dam in the wash by the fire station up there and you pick up trash. And, that, and what you're doing is really helping to protect the water quality of our watershed. And we get people, we usually have about 50 people who come out. Sometimes we'll have Boy Scouts who come and you know, service community groups that come and help us clean up. But you walk up and down the water supply that we give to you guys, walk all along that watershed area and clean it up. It's part of our program to keep the environment clean and keep our water supply in good quality. So that's usually after the 4th of July, because we know people go up there and they like to party on the 4th of July and they throw their stuff everywhere. And you wouldn't be surprised what, what kind of trash is up in that um, area. So that's our annual um, activity. We'd love to see you there. Sometimes it's hot, so wear a hat. Um, but it's a, fun, it's a fun event and there's usually some food afterwards for those people who are at work. And then this is a kind of a, uh, just a really detailed um, kind of snapshot, if you will, of some of the programs that we have available to, to our customers. Uh, you know, if you ever never thought of having a rain barrel and catching some of that rainwater, we give you a, a, a subsidy towards buying a rain, a rain barrel. Um, and, and, you know, turf removal, I talked about it, it's two, two and a half dollars a square foot up to $12,000 you can get uh, free from uh, MWD to, to change your landscape into something not impervious, but not uh, thirsty, like turf. Um, and then the toilet, if you've got to replace your toilet, you know, you could maybe have some money to get a high efficiency toilet, you know. Uh, if you don't really understand what kind of water usage you, you have at your home, you can get this landscape uh, efficiency audit done on your property and that'll tell you just if you don't want to change your landscape, but maybe there's something that you're doing that you could do better, like maybe the way your timers are set up, you know, maybe they're set longer than they should, and, and you'll have a professional help you, um, you know, understand how you could change just things around your house now and save water and save money. Um, and then there, this is a popular program too, this water pressure regulator valve. Uh, this is even if you have an existing home and Homes that have water pressure regulator valves are typically where you have um, 80 pounds, uh, pounds per square inch or greater of um, pressure in the system. You usually have a water pressure regulator on that system so that it reduces that pressure down to more like 50 or 60 pounds in the house so that your plumbing and whatnot doesn't get damaged. Sometimes those go bad. We have a program where they'll come out and they'll look at it. Uh, and if it needs to be replaced, they'll replace it, right, Michelle? Something like that? Completely everything. Free of truck. It's free, right? Yeah. That's a lot of money. I, I know I replaced my pressure regulating valve at my house. It cost me $350. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't have the advantage of this program. So, again, we got really super great programs. Michelle is the expert. She'll help you. She'll walk you through the process. Um, and... Generally speaking, I think that ends it for me. But we have, oh, Michelle, Michelle uh, 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 queued me up. We have a survey, if you wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes to tell, tell us whether you found this workshop informative. And that would be very helpful to us or what we could do better. And before you, before you leave, I wanted to um, also introduce to you the council members that are here tonight. I should have done that at the beginning of yeah. the presentation, my bad. We have uh, Mayor Pro Tem Elliott, Janice Elliott, she's here with us this evening. We have Rudy Zuniga, who's here this evening. We have Ricky Felix, and we have Bill Velto, who have all joined us this evening. We, have, we appreciate you coming very much. appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Thank you.